Hi, thank you so much for coming out today for this reading featuring artist Jay Chung. Um, we have an exhibition downstairs that hopefully you've all seen um, by Jay Chung and Q Takeki Meda. And um, they've been collaborating for over a decade and are based in Berlin, so we're really happy to have them out here for this. Um, so just to give you some very brief info about what he's about to read, um, it's, a, it's called Letters, and um, it's, um, a, it's Jay, well, did you do it yourself or both together? Okay, so it's Jay's collection of synopses from um, the letters in the Shmela archive that's at the Getty Center in LA. And um, the Shmela Archive is um, from, it's based around the Shmela Gallery, which um, is an intergenerational matriarchal type gallery that um, existed in Dusseldorf whoa, uh, from the 50s till the early 90s uh, when it closed. And then more recently, the granddaughter of the Shmelas, um, Lena, I believe her name is, um, opened a gallery under her own name um, in Berlin, and briefly it was above Isabella Bortolozzi Gallery, which is where J and Q show and where the photographs in this exhibit um, downstairs are taken. So, um, anyhow, here's Jay. Letters, um, box one, folder one, box one, folder two. To Eva Epley from Ulrika Schmela Bruning, the 2nd of March, 1983. Ulrika writes that one of the gallery's clients is interested in a, quote, head work by Epley that is similar to one sold in her exhibition at Gallery Schmela several years ago. She asks Epley if works of this kind are still available and what they cost. In a postscript, Ulrika writes that she would like Epley to send photos of the works if she has them on hand. To Ulrika Schmela Bruning, from Eva Epley, the 7th of March, 1983. Epley thanks Ulrika for her letter. She writes that the photos Ulrika requested are enclosed. The price for the sculpture head is 10,000 Swiss francs and the gallery will receive 33% of this price. If the gallery would like more than this, they will have to sell the work at a higher price. Epley writes that all of the heads made of cloth are in private collections and are therefore not for sale. To Eva Epley from Ulrika Schmela Bruning, the 18th of March, 1983. Ulrika writes to confirm that she has received Epley's photos and documentation. She writes that the interested collector is, of course, specifically interested in a, quote, cloth head, like the one from the exhibition years ago. Ulrika was very young at the time, but she remembers the heads. She writes that the gallery will try their luck with the collector and report back to Epley. In a postscript, Ulrika writes that she still has the cloth witch doll Epley gave her when she was little, and that she now uses it when playing with her own daughter. To Eva Epley, from Monica Schmela, the 23rd of March, 1983. Monica writes that the collector who was interested in the, quote, cloth head has contacted her again. She was reminded of a second collector who once bought the same work from the gallery. She has already contacted him to ask if he would be willing to sell. As she does not know the current price of the work, she could not go any further than this. Monica asks Epley how much a sewn, sewn head measuring 45 to 50 centimeters currently costs, and also asks the current price of the four, quote, veiled women, which the gallery also sold at the time. Monica writes that she called Epley several times but was told she was on vacation. She says she is happy that they are in contact once again, and that she read the easier introductory part of the text on astro-psychoanalysis, which she found interesting, although it seemed to her to be a very broad field. Monica writes that Epley has probably heard how everything has fallen apart for the Schmelas. It is for this reason that she wanted to write and hopes that they will be in touch soon. To Eva Epley from Monica Schmela, 
the 24th of October, 1983. Monica writes that the sale of Epley's work has fallen through. The collector cannot be convinced to acquire any work other than a, quote, cloth head. She apologizes for, un for any unnecessary trouble she may have caused Epley. In a postscript, she writes that it would be nice to meet sometime in the future. Box one, folder 16. Box one, folder 17. Box one, folder 21A. Box one, folder 24. To Alfred Schmela from Peter Berg, the 3rd of April, 1980. The artist, Peter Berg, expresses irritation that he has not received a response from the gallery about the information he sent about his work. He writes that he sent the information at the request of Benny Efrat, an artist represented by the gallery. To Peter Berg, from Alfred Schmela, the 8th of April, 1980. The letter is in reference to letters sent by Berg on February 18th, 1979, September 16th, 1979, and April 3rd, 1980. Alfred responds to Berg's letter dated April 3rd, 1980. He says that he finds Berg's letter unusually impertinent. He didn't ask for information about Berg's work and Benny Efra never mentioned his name. To Monica Schmela from Peter Berg, the 15th of June, 1981. Berg writes that he and his family enjoyed the time spent with Monica and Ulrike and that he hopes that they found his work interesting. Gallery Schmela is, he writes, his first choice to work with in Germany. Berg writes that he would like to make a sculpture in the gallery. To Peter Berg from Monika Schmela, the 21st of January, 1982. In response to a second letter addressed to her from Berg, Monika writes that the gallery must take commercial considerations into account, despite the fact that she and Ulrika enjoyed Berg's quote, performance in the gallery and found him and his family agreeable. For the time being, at least until she has seen Berg's work in person, an exhibition will not be possible. Box one, folder 25. Two Joseph Boys from Monica Schmela, the 15th of March, 1982. Monica writes to Joseph Boys that on May 30th, 1982, the gallery will be 25 years old. She writes that the gallery has known Boys for 24 of those 25 years. Boys was always, for Alfred and herself, the most important artistic position. Monica asks that Boys make a work in Alfred's memory on the occasion of the gallery's anniversary. She writes that she always remembers their time together in Kleve, when everything was just beginning. It can't be, she writes, that of all the things important to Boys, she and Alfred have become so unimportant. Unaddressed, undated a plastic sleeve for a prescription from the Albertus family in Loha, uh, pharmacy in Lohausen. Unaddressed, undated. A list of approximately 50 public and private collections to which the gallery has either offered or plans to offer Joseph Boys's Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts. The list is annotated in ink. To Christoph Engelhorn from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 3rd of June, 1983. Ulrike writes to Engelhorn that Boys has informed her that he has been interested in an important large-scale work by Boys for some time. She would therefore like to offer him the work Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts. She describes the work and writes that she is including an invitation from Boys' most recent, recent show at the gallery. To Peter Ludwig, from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 3rd of June, 1983. Ulrike offers Ludwig Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts by Joseph Boys. Ulrike describes the sculpture and says she is including a photo of the work installed at the gallery and an invitation card. Perhaps, she writes, the work might be suitable for Ludwig's new museum. To Mrs. de Manille from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 3rd of June, 1983. Ulrike offers de Manille Thus ended this 20 Jahrhunderts by Joseph Boys. She writes that she would be very happy if de Manille would like to see the sculpture in person if she is attending the Basel Art Fair. 
Ulrika describes the work, writing that she is including a photo of the installation and an invitation card. Two crystal sour, Samlung Krechts, from Ulrika Schmela Brüning, the 5th of June, 1983. Ulrika writes to Sauer to inform her of the Joseph Boys exhibition currently on in the gallery. She writes that, regardless of whether there is, quote, capital at Sauer's disposal, she would like to offer the work Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts. She describes the work and writes that she is including an invitation card. In a postscript, she asks for news of a recently opened museum in Schaffhausen. To Thomas Messer, Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, from Monika Schmela, the 9th of June, 1983. Ulrika offers Messer the sculpture Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts by Joseph Beuys. She writes that she is including a photo of the installation and an invitation card. To Dominique Bozo, Centre National d'Art et de Culture Georges Pompidou, from Ulrika Schmela Brüning the 9th of June, 1983. Ulrika offers Bozo the sculpture Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts by Joseph Beuys. She writes that she is including a photo of the installation and an invitation card. To, Monsieur, uh, to Mr. Nakamura, M. Nakamura Kamakura Gallery, from Ulrika Schmela Brüning, the 9th of June, 1983. Ulrika offers Nakamura the sculpture Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts by Joseph Boys. She writes that she remembers Nakamura asking for works by Boys some time ago and that she is including a photo of the installation and an invitation card. To Ulrika Schmela Brüning from Peter Ludwig, the 13th of June, 1983. Ulrik Ludwig informs Ulrika that Although he received the installation photo of the work Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts with great interest, he cannot consider acquiring the work at this time. To Ulrike Schmela Brüning from Mary Jane Victor, Menil Foundation, the 28th of June, 1983. Victor writes that the Menil Foundation's director, Walter Hobbs, cannot consider acquiring the work Das Ende des 20. Jahrhunderts by Joseph Boys. Box 1, folder 26. To Monica Schmela, Ulrike Schmela Brüning, Franziska Schmela, Andreas Brüning, from Eva Boys, undated. Boys thanks the Schmela family for the flowers they sent, apologizing for not thanking them sooner. The Schmelas know how hard it how the Schmelas know how it is to be in her situation, she writes. Although Boyce's husband was seriously ill for the entire year, she and her family hoped he would overcome it. He was surely spared more suffering. Boyce writes that Monica knows how short the early years were and how little time their work left them to enjoy it. Since the death of Alfred, the Boyces swore they would enjoy every day as a holiday so as not to carelessly lose even a second of precious time. She writes that, as the Schmelas have been affected, so has her family. It is with great effort that they search for the positive within them. She writes that she is happy Wenzel recently saw Franzi again. Boys is concerned about the remaining works that need to be restored and asks if Ulrika has a clear idea of what they had previously agreed on. At the moment, Boys herself cannot bring herself to concentrate on it. To Professor Nordemann from AFA Boys, the 4th of June, 1990. In the letter, Boys identifies the inauthentic alterations to one of her husband's works. She sends two supporting documents showing the original work, which consists of two bronze plates with an iron frame. The work was cast in 1968. In 1989, it was sold to the Galerie Schmela. The gallery then sold the work at the Basel Art Fair to a private collector. It later reappeared at the Fiac Art Fair in Paris. There, it was displayed properly on a box, as an employee of the Galerie de Fay will attest. A third document shows the work again, this time in the catalog of the Basel Art Fair. In the catalog, an iron frame has been added to the work in the style of the original frame, and the style uh, and in the style of boys, brown oil paint has been applied to the seams and the bronze mounts have also been redone. The shape of the work, or rather what has become of it, writes boys, is completely foreign to the original and of the lowest quality. 
Furthermore, the added changes are not indicated in the catalog. Boyes suggests that the inauthentic frame be destroyed, that the catalogs be stamped, and that additional penalties be applied if possible. She writes that if the object in question is the original and not a copy made from leftover material, the very beautiful sculpture was sold by Joseph Boyes to a Miss Trost, in whose collection it has remained for 20 years. The correct dimensions of the work should be compared with those of the object in question. Box one, folder 30, to Gilles Lapointe from Monica Schmela the 18th of May, 1983. Boy's response to Lapointe's request for information as part of his research for a critical edition of the works of Paul and Emile Bourdieu. In her letter, she includes a price list and four letters written by Mr. Bourdieu. She writes that she would very much appreciate a copy of the edition and that Mr. Bourdieu is remembered by the gallery as a charming personality and a, was a very good painter. Box two, folder one. To Dr. Jürgen Pratje von, from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 14th of March, 1985. Ulrike invites Pratje to the gallery to see an exhibition by Miriam Kahn. She writes that she is including with her letter a text on the artist by Richard Calvo Caressi of the Tate Gallery, as well as the artist's biography. Box two, folder four, to Kenneth Capps from Andreas Brüning, the 10th of June, 1981. Andreas writes that it was a pleasure to meet Capps in New York. He asks Capps to send slides of his steel and bronze drawings in preparation for the show at the Gallery Schmela at the beginning of 1982. He also asks for prices, shipping costs, and about Capps' availability. To Andreas Bruning from Kenneth Capps, the 14th of July, 1981. Capps writes that he is looking forward to showing his steel and bronze drawings at the gallery. He sends a list, of a list of prices detailing which metal finishes are available for each of his drawings, estimates for shipping costs, and when he will be able to travel to Germany in the coming months. Caps also asks if it is possible to show drawings with his sculptures. To Kenneth Caps from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 11th of August, 1981. Ulrike responds to Caps since Andreas is away for a few days. She writes that the gallery has decided to show only the raw steel drawings with the paper drawings. She proposes that, provided that the total weight does not exceed 1,000 pounds, Caps could send all the works so that they might freely decide which works best suit the gallery. Concerning the prices, Ulrike writes that it is impossible to set the prices ahead of time due to the Deutschmark's fluctuations against the dollar. Ulrike also writes that they would prefer February to March for the exhibition if Caps is amenable to this date change. To Andreas Brüning from Kenneth Caps, the 2nd of September, 1981. Caps responds to Andreas, saying that he appreciated the letter from Ulrike. He asks who will cover the transport costs of the work and what the gallery's plans are for returning unsold works. Caps asks again about prices and if the exhibition might be planned for April or May instead. To Kenneth Caps from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 2nd of October, 1981. Ulrike apologizes for the delay answering Caps' letter. She writes that the cost of shipping Caps' work by sea freight will be 370 US dollars, and she suggests that Caps look into the possibility of consolidated shipping. Ulrike asks if Caps would be able to transport his works to the shipper. Ulrike also explains that any unsold work will be returned to Caps, and if he agrees, certain pieces could be kept at the gallery on consignment. Ulrike also asks about some discrepancies on Caps' price list. She writes that April is out of the question for an exhibition at the gallery, as the gallery has another show scheduled, and she describes the concrete walls of the gallery as it pertains to hanging Caps' work. To Ulrike Schmela Brüning from Kenneth Capps, the 24th of October, 1981. Capps writes that he has contacted the gallery's shipping partner in Los Angeles and that it is indeed cheaper to use a consolidated shipment. He writes that he is able to deliver the work to the shipper. 
As to, price, as to the price discrepancies, some work are more expensive to produce than others due to technical dif differences. Caps asks for a fixed date for his exhibition. He writes that the concrete walls are ideal. His work will look elegant in the gallery. To Kenneth Caps from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 19th of November, 1981. Ulrike writes that the gallery has been badly affected by the recent weather. Caps's sculpture outside is still in good condition and it will be treated to protect it from the upcoming winter. Ulrike writes that after an entire night of debate, it was decided that the gallery would have to cancel Caps' upcoming show. After showing slides of Caps' work to collectors, it appears that his work is not desirable at the moment. The current taste is for Italians, such as Ernesto Tatafiori, Enzo Cucchi, Sandro Chia, Francesco Clemeni, and young German painting. Caps is, pr also, is probably also aware of a parallel trend in the United States, for example, Julian Schnabel and David Sally. In addition, the cost to mount the exhibition of Caps's work is too high. Ulrika writes that she hopes Caps is not too shocked, asking for his opinion. To Ulrika Schmela Brüning from Kenneth Caps, the 28th of November, 1981. My opinion is one of outrage and disbelief, writes Caps. Ulrika had never before mentioned any doubts prior to her letter, and furthermore, the work for the show has already been created. Caps writes that he has completed 12 new steel drawings for the exhibition at a cost to him of more than 5,000 US dollars. Caps also writes that he does not understand Ulrika's estimate for the cost of mounting his exhibition. Shipping would only be 370 US dollars with a consolidated shipment, and he would be willing to cover any excess costs. Caps writes that he has been looking forward to the exhibition, and he would still like to go ahead with it after resolving the situation. He asks for an immediate response from Ulrika. To Kenneth Caps from Ulrika Schmela Brüning, the 12th of December, 1981. Ulrika writes that the gallery understands Caps's reaction, expressing her apologies. She reiterates that the gallery did try their best to gauge their collector's reaction to Caps's work, but that they were sure that no one would buy the kind of works Caps makes. Ulrika writes that the gallery does not wish to cancel but to postpone the show until the wave of wild painting has settled. With Caps' work ready to ship, it's only a question of finding the appropriate time. To Gallery Alfred Schmela from Kenneth Caps, the 22nd of December, 1981. A dated and addressed letter in which Caps writes on a single line in capital letters, please return all of my slides. Box 2, folder 10. To Sandro Kia from Ulrika Schmela Brüning, the 30th of November, 1981. Ulrika writes that she has been unable to reach Kia on the telephone, although she has tried several times. She writes that Kia might remember her from the Gallery Schmela stand at the Dusseldorf Art Fair, which Kia visited several times to see a painting by Fernand Léger. At the time, Ulrika writes, she didn't know what Kia looked like. Had she known, she would have asked him to make a show in the gallery. Box 2, folder 11. Box 2, folder 12. Box 2, folder 25. To Andreas Brüning, from Thierry, surname unknown, undated. Thierry describes his projects. He's working on a book of kitchen writings, which he writes standing up due to back paints, and a life-size painting called Schmerzensfänger, number two among other things. At the end of his letter, he writes that he is looking forward to seeing Andreas again and sends his sympathies to Ulrika and Monica. Box 2, folder 29. To Enzo Kuki from Ulrika Schmela Brüning. Undated. Ulrika writes that she has been interested in Kuki's work for some time. She says that unfortunately it is difficult to obtain his drawings and paintings, although she does have a very nice small drawing. Ulrika asks if she might accompany Mr. Hannapol on his next visit to Kuki's studio. To Ulrika Schmela Brüning from Enzo Kuki, undated. On the back of a postcard depicting the House of the Fawn in Pompeii, Kuki sends his greetings to Ulrika. To Ulrika Schmela Brüning from Enzo Kuki, undated. Four postcards showing a post 
four postcards showing a perspective drawing by Leonardo, a work by Enzo Cucchi, one of Goya's black paintings, and Silva Plana. To Enzo Cucchi from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, undated. Ulrike asks if Kuki has considered her request to acquire some of his larger drawings. To Enzo Kuki from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 21st of May, 1984. Ulrike writes that she saw a large drawing by Kuki at MoMA in New York. She asks if she could acquire one of his works. To Enzo Kuki from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 1st of July, 1984. Ulrike thanks Kuki for the postcard he sent. She says that she will not be in Basel on the 3rd, but she will be there on the week of the 12th. She writes that they always seem to miss each other and that she only found out later that Kuki was in New York at the same time as her last visit. Ulrike writes that, she, that it seems hopeless to locate a work of his for sale. She will try not to give up and hopes they will be able to work together in the future. To Rene Dan uh, box two, folder 30. To Rene Daniels from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 17th of, of November, 1981. Ulrike writes that she has recently seen works by Daniels in the exhibition titled Westkunst. Knowing that Daniels was a stipend holder in München Gladbach, Ulrike called Dr. Clatters to arrange a studio visit. From Dr. Clatters, who forwarded her to the address to which she now writes, she found out that Daniels is sick. Ulrike asks Daniel to contact her for a studio visit as soon as he is well. Box four, folder 14A, to Ulrike Schmela Brüning from Gallery Neuendorf. A list of works by the jewelry artist Otto Jakob sent by the Gallery Neuendorf to the Gallery Schmela. The works range in price from 2,700 Deutschmarks to 3,600 Deutschmarks. To Ulrike Schmela Brüning from Hans Neuendorf, the 7th of February, 1986. Neuendorf writes that Ulrike has convinced him that 25% is not manageable and that he will stick to his agreement of a discount of one third for works of Otto Jakob. He asks that she let him know which works she likes best so that Jakob can work in that direction. To Ulrike Schmela Brüning from Gallery Neuendorf, the 13th of February, 1986, a list of two works by Otto Jakob sent from the Gallery Neuendorf to the Gallery Schmela. To Otto Jakob from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 23rd of May, 1986, Ulrike asks Ulrike writes to Jakob in preparation for his exhibition at the gallery. She sets the opening date, asks for photographic documentation of the works, and writes that she must make a visit to him before the Basel Art Fair. To Otto Jakob from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 25th of November, 1986. Ulrike writes that she has sold Jakob's work, Vespin, and that she will be sending it to him to be signed, upon which he should send it back to her. She asks if she should send the payment for the work to the Gallery Neuendorf or to Jakob directly. Ulrike writes that she has not been able to reach him by telephone and she wonders how the work for Mrs. Pinwin is coming. Unaddressed, undated. A watercolor illustration of one of Otto Jakob's works, Fierstärne 2. To Gallery Neuendorf from Ulrike Schmela Brüning the 25th of November, 1986. A list of works sold during the exhibition of Otto Jakob's jewelry at the Gallery Schmela. Ulrike asks that Neuendorf send her his payment details. To Frau Bota from Gallery, uh, to Frau Bota and Gallery Neuendorf from B. Tangerding, the 1st of December, 1986. The letter asks Bota to send an invoice to Ulrike for the work Vespin by Otto Jakob. Box 5, folder 10, box 5, folder 12. To Christian Löwenstein from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 2nd of December, 1980. Ulrike writes to inform Löwenstein, Löwenstein that his works have arrived safely at the gallery. 
He should let her know if they are for sale, and if so, for how much. The gallery is in the midst of planning its next ex exhibition with Wolfgang Nessler, and the art fair happily is over. Ulrike writes that it was frightfully difficult and much too long, even though she thinks they had a good stand. To Christian Löwenstein, from Ulrike Schmäler Brüning, the 7th of July, 1982. Ulrike writes that she is very concerned that she has not heard from Löwenstein since their, next, since their last letter of three months ago. She writes that Löwenstein has certainly received the invitation for the gallery's 25th anniversary exhibition where his work will be exhibited alongside those of Boys, Klein, Ucker, Rinke, and Tapies. To Christian Löwenstein from Ulrike Schmäler Brüning, the 1st of March, 1982. Ulrike writes that she and her mother find it unfortunate that they haven't heard from Löwenstein since his last visit to the gallery, and they are assuming that this has something to do with their conversation about exhibiting in other galleries. She writes that they would like to resolve the disagreement and hear her side, oh, hear his side, if he feels he has been treated unfairly. He must, however, understand the gallery's position. They talk themselves blue in the face about the artists working in the gallery, and they show Löwenstein's works to all of their clients. Ulrike writes that they have nothing per se against showing with other galleries, but that after all their effort, other galleries might sense an opportunity. She writes that this disagreement is nothing to lose a personal and business friendship over. Personal and business relationship over. Box 6, folder 12 to Walter Pichler from Ulrike Schmäler Brüning, the 20th of October, 1982. Ulrike writes to Walter Pichler in re reference to their conversation at the opening of a new museum in Mönchengladbach. They spoke about the possibility of Pichler making another exhibition at the gallery. She asks if he has considered her offer and if he could respond to her letter. To Walter Pichler from Ulrike Schmäler Brüning, 12th of July, 1984. Ulrike writes that she wrote to Pickler quite some time ago to ask if he was interested in making another exhibition at the gallery, but has received no reply. She has just heard that the Kunstverein Dusseldorf is planning a large exhibition of his work, and she asks if this might be an opportunity for a parallel exhibition at the Galerie Schmäler. She sends greetings from both her and her mother. Box 6, folder 22 to Ulrike Schmäler Brüning from Klaus Pinter, the 10th of July, 1983. Klaus Pinter writes that he hopes that Ulrike hasn't completely forgotten about him and his works. He asks if he could, as he, she told him. She, he asks if she could, as she told him she would, show his book to her mother. He writes that he would be thankful for an answer from the, quote, Schmäler family board regarding his chances for exhibition opportunities and that he is including photographs of his latest works. If there might be an opportunity in the future, Pinter would be able to visit the gallery on his return to Dusseldorf from France. To Klaus Pinter from Ulrike Schmäler Brüning, undated. Ulrike asks Mr. Pinter to please excuse her not writing. She has been traveling and also in Basel. She writes that the, quote, family board has seen his work, including Monica. The gallery believes that this is not the right moment for an exhibition of Pinter's works. Other than Joseph Boys and other big names, there is hardly any interest for anything other than Ville de Malerai. Ulrika writes that she and some other sensible people are waiting for this trend to end, but that it is sure to last a while longer. Box 6, folder 26, to Sigmar Polka from Ulrike Schmäler Brüning, the 2nd of April, 1983. Ulrike writes that she was planning to send Polka a check for the sale of a work, but thought that it might be more convenient to combine the payment with one for an upcoming sale in a bank transfer. Ulrike asks that Polka come to sign the work sold. She would be able to pick him up in Cologne. She says that she would like to buy drawings and gouaches from him, even paintings. Ulrike punctuates the sentence with a line of exclamation points and asterisks. In capital letters, she enthusiastically asks if he would like to make an exhibition. 
to Sigmar Polka from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 14th of December, 1983. Ulrike writes that Caspar Koenig's upcoming exhibition in Dusseldorf, which she mentioned at her last visit with Polka, has been approved with a three million Deutschmark budget. Koenig has certainly asked, asked Polka to participate. Ulrike asks if Polka would make an exhibition in the gallery concurrent with Koenig's show. To Sigmar Polka from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 20th of June, 1984. Ulrike asks Polka to let the gallery know if there are additional paintings that should be included in the exhibition in Cologne. Since the gallery will be closed for the holidays, everything must be picked up beforehand. She asks if gouaches will be included and if Polka knows what he will be showing in Kaspar Koenig's exhibition. There is a line of exclamation points. Ulrika writes that she would very much like to come and see, come to see Polka's gouaches before her holidays. To Sigmar Polka from Ulrika Schmela Brüning, the 24th of June, 1984. Ulrika writes that she has just read in Kunstforum that Polka is planning a new series of works for Kaspar Koenig's exhibition. She writes that she has told him of her interest in making an exhibition of his work some time ago, but that she cannot make any progress owing to the fact that the gallery has only that owing to the fact that the gallery only has seven paintings, which are not enough for a show. Ulrika asks that Polka please consider allowing the gallery to buy works from von hier aus. She asks if she can visit Polka again. To Dr. S. Gore from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 16th of September, 1984. Ulrike writes to ask if Gore would be able to return the three paintings lent by the gallery that were not included in the Kunsthaler Köln's Sigmar Polka exhibition. She also asks if Gore would be able to recommend someone to photograph the two Sigmar Polka paintings included in the exhibition. To Sigmar Polka from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 19th of September, 1984. Ulrika writes that she does not want to nag, but that one must be persistent. She writes that she has seen an entire new series of work in Cologne. Couldn't he strongly consider doing an exhibition at the gallery? The gallery is holding the large paintings, but this would not be enough for an exhibition over the two floors of the gallery. Ulrika writes that she, Ulrika says that she will visit Cologne very soon and she hopes that Polka is not going on a world, world tour after von hier aus. Box six, folder 30. To Karl Manfred Rennertz from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 5th of January, 1983. Ulrike writes that she has returned from Nordhorn. Even though her trip to Nordhorn from Münster was enjoyable, it rained so frightfully that she was happy when Nordhorn was finally in sight. Ulrike writes that she liked Rennertz's work very much, but that she didn't like the space. She asks Rennertz for some details regarding his upcoming exhibition, how many works, at what price they should be sold, and if he has a preference for the invitation card. To Eckhart Schneider, Städtische Gallery Nordhorn, from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 5th of January, 1983. Ulrike writes that she has just returned from Nordhorn, where she enjoyed the show of Karl Manfred Rennertz's work very much. Unfortunately, she writes, she and Schneider didn't have occasion to meet, but hopes it will be possible in the future. Ulrike asks Schneider if it would be possible to route some of the returning works from Rennertz's show at the Städtische Galerie to the Galerie Schmela. To Reiner Andres from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 12th of January, 1984. Ulrike writes that she is hesitant to call Andres because he is always so incredibly busy. She has sent Andres two framed gouaches by Ulrike Nattermüller, priced at 1,100 Deutschmarks and 680 Deutschmarks. She asks that Andres contact her about the aquarelles by Ucker. Otherwise, Ulrike writes, there is nothing new to report. Two friends of hers have just died. Also, it has been raining frightfully for days. To Ulrike Schmela Brüning from Reiner Andres, undated. 
Andres writes that he must return the works. His finances do not permit him to acquire them at this time. He thanks Ulrike for her efforts. To Reiner Andres from Monika, Monika Schmela, the 1st of February, 1984. Monica writes that the gallery has received the works back from Andres. The Uker shipment was returned without having been opened by Andres. Monica writes that she, specs, that she suspects that Andres may have been offended in some way, and for this she is very sorry. The gallery works very hard for Andres. Monica remembers the care with which, uh, with which Alfred personally prepared crates for him. She and Ulrika have always placed a value on trust. And Andres can rest assured that his trust would never be abused. Monica writes that she would like to explicitly make clear that the price of 1,100 Deutschmarks for each of Netter Müller's drawings is exactly the same as it was in 1981. Andres also acquired works for 300 Deutschmarks, 750 Deutschmarks, and 680 Deutschmarks. The price difference of 50 Deutschmarks was due to higher framing costs and sales tax. Monica asks Andres to write to her. Ulrika is upset. She believes that Andres no longer trusts her. She hopes that their relationship can be restored. To Reiner Andres from Ulrika Schmela Brüning, the 1st of June, 1984. Ulrika writes that she and her mother will be in Andres' area during Pentecost. She asks if they might perhaps meet, saying that they will be staying with her aunt in Gundelfingen. She writes that the gallery is showing works by Edward Allington and that perhaps Andres would be interested. To Reiner Andres from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 19th of June, 1984. Ulrike writes that she was very happy to visit Andres, even though he was unprepared for their visit. She was astounded by his collection. Ulrika offers Andres works from Edward Allington priced at 660 Deutschmarks and 900 Deutschmarks, asking if she should send them to him. To Reiner Andres from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 25th of September, 1984. Ulrika writes that she has finally reached Karl Manfred Rennertz on the telephone. She proposes that her husband, who must deliver a work to a client in Karlsruhe between October 15th and 20th, transport several of Renert's sculptures of different sizes to Andres. He could take his time making a decision. The sculptures that Andres decides against could be brought back by Ulrike's husband, as the gallery is planning to exhibit them at the upcoming art fair. She asks that And Andres contact her contact her to set a date at his convenience. To Karl Manfred Rennertz from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 3rd of October, 1984. Ulrike writes that her husband will come with a truck to Rennertz's studio as planned. She asks that Rennertz, that she asks Rennertz to let her know which day would be convenient. To Karl Manfred Rennertz from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, the 9th of October, 1984. Ulrika writes that she is including a check for the two sculptures sold at the art fair. A discount of 10% was given to Mr. Ullers on account of him already having acquired two of Rennertz's works. Ulrika writes that she trusts that Rennertz agrees with the discount and that she deducted the amount from his share. Ulrika asks if there are additional, quote, Dicko works available for another interested collector, and if Reynards could send photos and prices. There has been no word regarding the other collector who is interested in one of Reynards' sculptures. Ulrika asks that as soon as she returns from New York, she will remind the collector. Oh, Ulrika says that as soon as she returns from New York, she will remind the collector. To Karl Manfred Reynards from Ulrika Schmela Brüning, the 19th of October, 1984. Ulrika writes that she spoke on the telephone with Karl Egon Wester to ask if he and Dr. Salzmann have decided which works they would like to acquire from the exhibition in Rheinhausen. Mr. Wester no, knew already, but Ulrika would like to. Mr. Wester knew already, but Ulrika would like Renards to provide her with some clarifications and catalog numbers for the sculpture. 
As far as the sale, Ulrike writes, it would be advantageous for tax reasons if the sale would go through the gallery. She asks if a commission of 25% for the gallery would be satisfactory for Reynolds and if a discount would be acceptable. Ulrike also apologizes for accidentally hanging up on Lisa and for not being able to receive Reynolds' family on the previous Saturday evening. Ulrike writes that she has been trying to reach Reynolds on the telephone. She thanks him for the loan form and asks if the work is coming back to the gallery. In addition, Ulrike would like Reynolds to come to the gallery to show his work to an, inter to an interested collector. She writes that her husband could bring him from and return him to Baden-Baden to Karl Manfred Reynolds from Ulrike Schmela Brüning, 5th of December, 1984. Ulrike writes that she has offered the three, quote, Seestern sculptures and the, quote, Dicker work for sale, and that a further sale will be finalized in 1985. Regarding Mr. Ehlers, Ulrike writes that he came to the gallery at the art fair with a postcard from Reynolds instructing him to go to the gallery Thomas, underlined, not the gallery Schmela. Ulrike sarcastically thanks Reynolds. She writes that she can't understand why Reynolds is so unflexible. He can probably imagine that the gallery is interested in making as much money as possible, but that they must be willing to negotiate, especially when a collector acquires multiple works from an artist. The issue is not, Ulrike writes, about the 849.99 Deutschmarks that Reynolds is demanding but rather the fact that Reynolds went behind their backs in the sale to Duisburg. As Reynolds knows, Karl Egon Wester first saw the work at the Gallery Schmela, and even then, he and Dr. Salzman wanted to acquire a work for the museum, although there were no funds for this. Karl Egon also wanted to acquire a work privately for himself, but claimed, however, that he didn't have the money. Ulrike suspects Karl Egon went directly to Reynolds for a, quote, discounted price. Ulrike adds that the commission of 25% for the sale to the Lembruck Museum is owed to the Gallery Schmela from Reynolds, and not, as Reynolds claims, from Dr. Salzman. She proposes that the gallery keep his commission as their commission for the Duisburg sale. It would be unfortunate, Ulrike writes, if their working relationship with Reynolds should come to an end. One should, however, expect fairness and not only from the side of the gallery. To Ulrike Schmela Brüning from Karl Manfred Reynolds, the 7th of December, 1984. Reynolds thanks Ulrike for her letter. He writes that it is now evident to both of them that he sent Mr. Ehlers to the gallery Schmela, although he could have just as easily brought Ehlers to his studio and not troubled himself with the gallery's discount. He writes that he would like to be consulted Otherwise, he can make up his own fantasy prices. Reynolds writes that he finds Ulrike's accusation that he, quote, went behind the back of Gallery Schmela insulting. It implies that Reynolds undercut a sale already fixed by the gallery. In truth, writes Reynolds, Dr. Salzman has been interested in the purchase since 1978. The Duisburger piece has not yet been paid for by Karl Egon Vesper, because he wanted to go through the gallery. Reynolds has known Karl Egon since school, and it was Ulrike who advised Reynolds to decline the invitation to show in Duisburg. Reynolds writes that only after Ulrike retracts her accusations, especially the claim that he was, quote, going behind their back, will he consider resolving this matter. In regard to their working relationship, Reynolds writes that he feels sidelined not supported or represented or whatever else the gallery is supposed to do. It's up to the gallery Schmela to change this. In a postscript, Reynolds asks for the return of his Schwarze mit Spitzen Schultern to Karl Manfred Reynolds from Monika Schmela, the 18th of December, 1984. Monica writes that before Ulrike responds to Reynolds' letter of December 12th, she would like to call for a ceasefire to examine the proceedings concerning the two collectors. In the heat of the battle, she writes, Reynolds even forgot to put a signature on his letter. Monica writes that she is proud to have been married to a very important gallerist, and it is in this tradition that she intends to continue the gallery. She writes that she knows very well what a gallery is, and moreover, what it is not quote, supposed to do. Ulrike knows this as well. 
An artist should also know what kind of relationship he intends to have. In other words, it should not be the case that he only plans to make a single exhibition with a gallery from the outset. A working relationship must be established through mutual trust and can only last as long as this is upheld. The gallery has never failed to conduct itself seriously, a fact to which all of the artists involved with the, gallerist, un, involved with the gallery will attest. A word on the subject of Reinhausen. The gallery was of the opinion that Reynolds's work would be more suited to the Lembrook Museum, and Ulrika simply wanted to point this out. Monica writes that she spoke to Dr. Salzman before his departure. Reynolds's sculpture is still in the cellar, and Dr. Salzman does not have the means to acquire it. The decision is therefore in Dr. Brockman, Brockhaus's hands. Monica wishes Reynolds a happy holiday. To Carl Manf Manfred Reynolds from Monica Schmela, the 5th of March, 1985. Ulrika thanks Reynolds for his card. She writes that a collector found the prices for his works too high. She advised the collector that the prices will increase in January by 10%, but if he should decide to acquire one, he will be able to do so at the, quote, old price. This discount will come from the gallery's commission. Ulrika writes that Reynolds's work was offered to a museum in France, but she hasn't received an answer from them yet. She asks if the gallery might show two of Reynolds's works at Art Basel, and also if he is planning to show with other galleries there. Box 6, folder 34. To Klaus Rinke, Staatliche something Dusseldorf. There's a misprint, sorry. From Monika Schmela, the 21st of May, 1980. Monika writes that she doesn't understand why Rinke doesn't feel the need to contact her, despite the fact that Alfred is in the hospital. The postcard she left for him at the Kunstakademie was picked up. Monica writes that although it was agreed in the presence of Alfred, Rinke and herself that Dr. Peters would acquire a quote pendulum work for his museum, Rinke now disputes the sale without giving his reasons for doing so. She asks Rinke to please contact her at the gallery in the morning or afternoon as she is usually at the hospital in the evening. To Monica Schmela from Klaus Rinke, the 2nd of June, 1980. Rinka writes that after a long telephone conversation with Mr. Peters, they met on Sunday, June 1st at the Krenz Heron Church. The quote, plum work will in fact be acquired by Dr. Peters. However, as Rinka mentioned on the phone, the gallery Schmela has been in possession of the work since 1975. It will therefore be sold at a price of 42,000 Deutschmarks, not 35,000 Deutschmarks. Rinka writes that he will receive two-thirds of the sale price, not half, following the example of his other dealers who receive 50% only in the case that they are exhibiting the work sold in an exhibition and 30% otherwise. He says that this is necessary due to his high production costs. In a postscript on the back side of the letter, he sends his greeting to Alfred and wishes him a speedy recovery. To Monika Schmela from Hans Albert Peters, Kunstmuseum Dusseldorf, the 8th of December, 1980. Peters writes that he received Monica's letter and the pro forma invoice. He agrees that he did, in fact, speak about acquiring the work Mess Instrument for Zeitlosigkeit by Klaus Rinke at the evening held in honor of Ricky DeMarco. Having previously spoken to Peters about the work, Alfred used this occasion to offer the work again at a price of 28,000 Deutschmarks. With this figure in mind, Peters went to Mr. Rinke, who then voiced his disagreement about the sale. Peters writes that he is very happy that Monica was able to change Mr. Rinke's mind. However, despite all of this, Peters disagrees with Monica's insinuation that he, quote, purchased the work. Peters writes that Monica knows as well as he does that he is not able to make purchases without the authorization of his board. He demands that Monica refrain from, sen from sending him correspondence either in the form of invoices or with references to invoices, as such letters make his work very difficult. Due to a lack of available funds, Peters writes, the purchase of Brinker's work will have to be delayed until 1981. Peters also demands that Monica stop pressuring him, as she has been doing so by a wide variety of means. 
He reminds Monica that over the course of 1980, the museum has already acquired works from the Galerie Schmela by Richard Tuttle, Ilona and Wolfgang Weber, and in partnership with the Deutsche Bank, Joseph Boys. The amount spent on these works totals more than 600,000 Deutschmarks. The museum has not purchased such a quantity of work from any other gallery. To Hans Albert Peters, Kunstmuseum Dusseldorf, from Monika Schmäler, the 15th of December, 1980. Monika thanks Peters for his letter, writing that she is happy about the museum's plan to acquire the work by Klaus Rinke, and that it goes without saying that she will be content to wait until the funds are released for the work in the middle of 1981. She writes that she would, however, like to dispute several of Peters' claims in his last letter. It is not true, she writes, that her husband could have offered the work at a price of 28,000 Deutschmarks. The gallery's price list shows a price of 36,000 Deutschmarks, the correctness of which is further evidenced by the fact that Dr. Thiemann from the Museum of Ostwald, Ostwald Dortmund made an offer for the work at this price in February 1976, and that a similar work, also titled Mess Instrument für Zeitlosigkeit, was purchased by the Laufs collection at the beginning of 1976 for 34,200 Deutschmarks. In addition, Mr. Rinke did not agree with the price of 36,000 Deutschmarks, but instead believed a higher price of 42,000 Deutschmarks to be more appropriate. It was because Mr. Rinke had not notified Monica or her husband of this that Peters was offered the work at 36,000 Deutschmarks. Monica writes that she is indeed aware, on the basis of long time experience of similar cases with museums, that purchases cannot be carried out until the proper authorization has been given. When a museum signals their intent to purchase, purchase she therefore sends a pro forma invoice which is then replaced with an actual invoice when appropriate. Monica writes that she sent the notification letter only because she had no other choice. Her husband can no longer be consulted. And then there's a footnote. Alfred Schmela died on July 20th, 1980. As for Peters' claim that she has been pressuring him with a wide variety of means, this was not her intention. She, knew, she only knew that the museum has long been interested in purchasing Mr. Rinka's work. Monica wishes Peters a happy holiday, writing that she hopes that the matter will be resolved to everyone's satisfaction. To Hans Albert Peters, Kunstmuseum Dusseldorf, from, from Klaus Rinka, the 10th of January, 1981. Rinka thanks Peters for the carbon copy of his letter to Monica, written on December 8, 1980. He then describes in detail the events that occurred at the Kunstmuseum's evening for Ricky DeMarco, which are up for debate. Rinka writes that he and his companion, along with the Rukas family, were the very first to arrive at the event. He had already been served a glass of whiskey before the next guests arrived. It was over this whiskey that Peters approached him about the plum work installed in the Gallery Schmela's Lohausen house. Rinka writes that he said that this work was conceived in preparation for his work at Documenta. At this point, Rinka was not aware of Peters' intention to acquire the work. A few minutes later, writes Rinka, the second group of guests arrived, including the Schmela family and Mr. Krinka. At this time, Rinka was served his second whiskey, and he was thus still clear-headed when Alfred said to him, Klaus, I just sold your work. Rinka asked Alfred, for how much? Alfred replied, ja, for what the price is, 36,000 Deutschmarks. Rinka writes that he was angry about this, as a year later, Alfred had raised the price of a newer work from 36,000 Deutschmarks to 42,000 Deutschmarks. 36,000 Deutschmarks being the price set by Rolf Ricke at the beginning of the 70s for a work now hanging in the Kaiser Wilhelm Museum in Krefeld. Krefeld. In the last five years, writes Ricke, his prices have risen considerably, and it is for this reason he disagreed with the sale, and not, as Peters believes, because the work is not for sale. As for Peters saying that he had in mind the price of 28,000 Deutschmarks, this is in no way possible. Painters can imagine whatever price he pleases, but in fact, but the fact is the work, consisting of 40 plumb lines extending from a single point on the floor to hooks on the ceiling, costs 36,000 Deutschmarks, 
and he should be pleased that he is able to enjoy a prize set by Rolf Ricke in 1972. Whatever came out of the conversation that night, and whatever Alfred may have promised you, is Dr. Peters' problem, writes Rinke. Rinke writes, Rinke says that Peters cannot demand that he sells such early, significant works, which for years have been set at a fixed price and sold to the Neue Nationalgalerie, Berlin, the Staatsgalerie, Stuttgart, the Tate Gallery, London, the Hamburger Kunsthalle, the Bayerische Staatsgalerie, and the Gemälde Gallery collections, as well as to private collections, nor should they demand to obtain them for so little money, simply because there was a price they, quote, had in mind. How would that make me look, Rinka asks, to all those museums, galleries, and collectors? Rinka also writes that the drawing acquired by painters from Max Hetzler and the aforementioned work from Alfred, because they complement each other and Rinka's body of graphic work so well, are exceptional pieces both artistically and for a collection. Rinka then writes that the question of the acquisition of a third work can be discussed at a later point. He writes of his willingness to cover the costs for his upcoming exhibition, Wasserwerk und Zeichnungen, at the Kunstmuseum, by pledging a work. Rinka writes that he hopes that the cultural board, which has been deciding on how to acquire his work since the 1977 documenta, will authorize the acquisition of the drawing and the plum works. While Peter's predecessor may have had difficulties in acquiring the kind of works that Rinka makes for the collection, Rinka hopes that the cultural board will decide in favor of Peter's forward-looking concept for the acquisition of new works, so that the public will not have to travel to Australia or essen kartenberg to see the internationally shown artworks representative of the creativity of the local Dusseldorf scene. A postscript under Rinka's signature reads, quote, at the moment, still in Dusseldorf. To Monica and Ulrike from Klaus Rinke, the 19th of December, 1989. A handwritten note addressed to both Monica and Ulrike, accompanying a drawing resembling Alfred. Rinke writes that a few days earlier, he was drawing absentmindedly when there appeared in front of him someone they both know. Rinke writes that he did not want, he did not want to keep this from them, so he is sending a photocopy. Isn't it strange? Oh, sorry. Isn't that strange, he writes. Rinka writes, Rinka wishes Monica and Ulrika well from his studio by the sea, writing that he will be back in Hahn in January. Thank you. <laughs>